We're ready to start. Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you're enjoying Sturbridge if you haven't been here before. And I always like to tell my story of if you don't know about Sturbridge, uh, the town next to Sturbridge is, Char is Charlton and also Brookfield. So do you know that there's actually a place called Podunk? Did you know that? There's actually a Podunk Road in Brookfield and immortalized by um, George M. Cohen who spent his summers in Brookfield. So when you hear Podunk, there really is a Podunk. And I live about five miles from Podunk, which shows you how far out in the, in the woods I am. Well, good morning. And this session is Act on Alzheimer's. My name is Christine Alessandro. I'm the Executive Director of Bay Path Elder Services, which is covering the Metro West area. Presenting with me this morning is Arthur Bergeron, attorney with Myrick O'Connell and Kelly Burke, director of the Northborough Council on Aging. Act on Alzheimer's is a wonderful program, and I will tell you that we just got back about a month ago from seeing the program in action in Minnesota, and it was absolutely fabulous. We are very excited about this, knowing that we will meet the needs of people with dementia in the community. Next. But first, I'd like to talk a little bit about the statistics about dementia. What we know is that one in nine people over the age of 65 will develop Alzheimer's, and one in three people over the age of 85 will develop Alzheimer's. These are the population statistics for 2010 from the census. The Act on Alzheimer's program is a grant-funded program that we are initiating in Northborough, Marlborough, and Hudson. You might ask, why those three communities? First of all, they're contiguous communities, which we thought was very important for grant purposes. Second is, I know that the, I know the three directors of the senior centers very well and have worked with them for a long time. And when I approached them, they were enthusiastic about the program. And thirdly, we knew, we knew the municipal governments would also be very receptive to this type of program. So what we wanted to do in Metro West is start with these three communities and then start branching out and then start branching out further to the entire state. So when we look at these three communities and the population from the 2010 census, we can see the population over the age of 65. So in Marlboro, you have almost 4,900 people over the age of 65. And again, this is the 2010 census. We're coming up to the 2020. So the population over 85 would be 835. One in three will have Alzheimer's. We're not talking about other dementias, so you're going to nudge that number up a bit. So if over 85, one in three, you're looking at over 200 people in the community over 85 with dementia. If one in nine has it, then you're looking at Marlboro, 537 people based on the census data, that's a lot of people in our communities that have dementia. You can apply these statistics to your community as well. The number is not going to go down. The number is going to go up, as we know, because the population of folks over the age of 60 is increasing. 10,000 individuals turn 65 every day. These are statistics you know. You see them in your community. And if you're like me, you're wondering, how are we going to help all of these people? Next. So I, I wanted to give you a little background on that and to talk about how many people are potentially going to be affected. Now I'd like to turn it over to Kelly Burke for her part. Thanks, Christine. Good morning. Um, what is ACT on Alzheimer's? So we were very fortunate, like Christine said, to go out to Minnesota to meet the people that actually have put this into um, into play in their communities. It's all volunteer driven and it's statewide. It's a collaboration of a lot of people to create the dementia friendly communities for people, live, people living with Alzheimer's as well as other dementias and to support their families and their caregivers. Um, passionate I think is one of the um, the best descriptions of uh, this program because it seems that um, every community that we got to see a snapshot of really um, pulled together as a community and made this work and, and had projects that were absolutely phenomenal that came out of those action committees. Um, 
Okay, thank you. The goals are um, really to identify and invest in promising approaches that reduce cost and improve care. As all of us know, um, aging in place is a um, is a word that we use a lot in our field. Obviously, people with Alzheimer's want to stay in their um, own homes, and we find that the research um, is that most of the people that are dealing with this are in the communities, not in institutions. Um, we also want to increase the detection of Alzheimer's disease and improve the, the support and the care out there. So that's through early um, detection screenings. That's one of the projects that we found out about when we were out in um, Minnesota. We also want to sustain caregivers um, for the obvious reason. We all know what it does to care caregivers to be taking care of um, people with any kind of dementia or Alzheimer's. Uh, we want to equip communities to become dementia capable so they can carry on and support the people that are living in their community and living with this disease and raise awareness so that people in the communities know what are the signs of Alzheimer's, how do people live with Alzheimer's and dementia, and what can the community do. We, um, uh, can we go back to that slide? Thank you. Um, one of the stories that came out when we were in Minnesota, um, a mom and her daughter went out to a restaurant and the mom had Alzheimer's. And the waitress came over to take the order and was really talking down to the mom and treating her like she was a child, really. Took her order, came back with the sandwich, and when she put it down, the mom said, no, I didn't order a tuna melt, I wanted egg salad. And the waitress, had, waitress proceeded to argue with, no, you didn't. You ordered the tuna melt, and that's what you're going to get. And it was just a very sad and frustrating experience, as you can imagine. And the daughter said, I, don't, I didn't even want to go back to that restaurant. I didn't want to go back to any restaurant if this is the way it's going to be. And the mom was upset, too, because she knew that she wasn't treated with the respect. So part of this, you know, we talk about professionals being... Um, trained in Alzheimer's and dementia, but part of this program is really getting that education out to the whole community. So we want to take a little break right now and do some brainstorming and wanted to ask um, all of you to kind of tell us what you think a dementia-friendly community is. And we'll hold the slide until we get some feedback. So we'll go to the next slide. This is uh, really a dementia-friendly community. All these clouds represent um, what this program believes needs to be in place for a truly dementia-friendly community. So um, some of the things that we um, touched on here, um, working together. Um, the dementia-friendly businesses, customer and employee um, support, it, like we talked about going into the library or going into a store so that people know kind of what the, to expect from somebody with um, Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, the awareness of um, community centers um, is, is part of that. Uh, independent and living in meaningful engagement so that people aren't isolated, so they can go out and go to um, a senior center or some other community um, place where they're accepted and people know um, about them. Um, we talked about emergency preparedness and response. Um, that's as we move on and talk about the action team that comes about from this program, um, we'll see how that kind of fits into the program as well. Um, accessible, user-friendly transportation environments. Again, transportation, you know, people may um, need some extra help with that if they're dropped off at a, a medical appointment, how to, you know, what door of the hospital to come out of and that kind of thing. Um, early diagnosis and quality care we talked about a little bit before. Um, that's that early detection screening and um, socialize memory loss supports and services so the people really can belong and, and be active and remain in their community. I just want to say this is going to be our goal of the project, to make all aspects of the community dementia friendly, dementia capable. So you're looking at all sectors. You want to make sure, my, you want to make sure that some, when somebody goes into a restaurant,
that they're going to have a good experience. So you're going to have trained wait staff. You know, as Arthur says, you just want to give them a choice of chicken or fish. You don't want to give them the whole menu. You want a positive experience out of that. When we talk about first responders, what I remember so acutely happened in Massachusetts a number of years ago was a woman was out walking with her baby, and there was a gentleman, you know, also walking, and the gentleman had dementia. And he stopped and spoke with the woman a moment and, you know, admired the baby and said, can I hold the baby? So she said, of course. So she gave the baby to the gentleman, and he walked away with the baby. All right? Now, now you have panic in the mother. You have panic because 911 is coming, and they're arresting this man because he walked off with the baby. But no one understood he had dementia. So they put the man in jail. I mean, it must have been terribly frightening. But that speaks to me of how we have to educate the community to really understand what is going on, not as all as it first appears. Next, please. The wonderful thing about the Act on Alzheimer's initiative in Minnesota, and it may be called Act on Alzheimer's, but it does include all dementias, including older adults with Down syndrome who may have dementia. The great thing about the Act on Alzheimer's uh, program, Act on Alzheimer's program, is that they have put together all the resources you will need, and they are all free of charge. I have a binder up front. It's about two, three inches thick. That is the Act on Alzheimer's toolkit. They have taken from soup to nuts, put together this toolkit with everything that you need to implement the program in your community. And there are other models out there, but to me, having a, a toolkit and having that roadmap, you, you can't beat it. All the work is done for you. On the Act on Alzheimer's website, feel free to use any of their materials. It's all in public domain. Their request is, is that you attribute it to the Act on Alzheimer's initiative in Minnesota. So we walked away with several of these toolkits, and over a two-day period in Minnesota, they walked us through the entire toolkit. So now that is my Bible. That's what we're going to be working on. Notice it is not a small Bible. <laughs> so they have included, literally have included everything in it. But the toolkit is a four-phase process. And this process is meant to take 12 to 15 months. They have identified four distinct phases of implementing the initiative. Those phases, as you can see, are convene, assess, analyze, and then act together. So your first phase is convening, which is where our group is right now. We have what is called a leadership group, or informally known as a super group. We're, kind of, we're leading the initiative. We're three communities together. And it's important for me to say, this is not a Bay Path initiative. To me, this is not a senior center initiative. It's a grassroots initiative. The work is done by the folks in the field, your community members. They need to be invested in this. That's so important. That's who's doing the work. And that's why I feel even though Bay Path applied for the grant and received the grant, this is not a Bay Path initiative. This is a community initiative. You're going to convene your key, key community members together. So you're going to find a champion. Who is a champion in your community? To me, our champion is Arthur. It might be your uh, chief of police. It might be your senior center director. It might be a caregiver of someone with Alzheimer's disease. What you're going to do first is assemble an action team. So what we have done, what this group has done, is each uh, director has assembled a list of those folks that they think would be great on the action team. And again, it's cross-cutting on the community. So we will approach those folks and invite them to be on the action team, explain what the initiative is. And then when you have your action team together, one of the most important things to remember is everyone has a task on the action team. That's why bringing people together, you're not bringing people together just to talk. You're bringing people together to do. Everyone must have a task. I went off the line. I'm straying. I was 
All right. Thank you for putting me back on this track, literally. <laughs> so you convened and form an action team. Second is you're going to assess the current strengths and gaps within the community. So how are you going to do that? You are going to survey the community. And what tool do you use? You are going to use a survey that Act on Alzheimer's has developed and is in the toolkit. There are surveys for each segment of the population medical providers, caregivers, uh, emergency responders, and each survey is tailored to that specific segment. When you've done the assessment phase and you pull all your surveys together, you are actually going to get data, hard data, that will indicate to you what the needs of the community are. So that's the analysis phase. You're going to look at all the data, and again, you actually have data. It's not thinking, well, we need education. Your community members, those surveyed out in the community, are saying these are what the needs are. And lastly, you're going to pull everyone together in a community meeting and you're going to act. You're going to develop a plan for implementation of what you are going to do to address the needs of the community. So again, this project is three communities, Northboro, Marlboro, and Hudson. Three lovely communities, but very different. Each has its own different culture. The leadership group, we bring a variety of skills, contacts. The people that Kelly know in the community are not the people that I know. Arthur has his own contacts that he's bringing into this. And we all bring a different knowledge set to the table as well. We, I, I've identified Arthur, I have to say me, as a community champion, and he's part of the, the question that we have about funding. Kelly is our community leader on the grassroots level. She knows the community, and I know the aging network, and I'm the grant writer. So we've identified those roles for us as well. Now I am going to turn it over to my dear friend, Arthur Bergeron, for his section. Hello. Uh, so my name is Arthur Bergeron. Um, my day job is I'm an elder law attorney, uh, but I, I do this. My mother died in a nursing home when I was back in 1991. My older brother, 78, has got an early stage diagnosis. My older sister, who's 81, has got a husband that she's trying to deal with at home who's got kind of mid-stage dementia. So like I get this. <laughs> so this is kind of, the, these, these are the issues that I'm really interested in. Um, and, and I think this, this, pro, this program is just, it just really, really important. I think some of the examples that you were just giving uh, uh, when, when, when asked of what, how a community could look, the, the things that we're all thinking about, everybody who is dealing with these kinds of issues is thinking about this stuff all the time. You all feel there's something more that should be done, that there are people who are kind of trapped in their houses or they're heading to assisted livings, you know, they're all being sold, they have to go to assisted livings, they all, nobody wants to go to a nursing home, but the question is how we do this. So I think it kind of, all of this rings true to people. What was so exciting about going to Minnesota, and by the way, another one of our players from Minnesota is here, Janice Long, but she's the director in Hudson, but she's a shy person, so she didn't want to be on the panel. <laughs> but, but if you have any questions, you know, she's right there, okay? Just, I just want to make sure that you know that she's there. So, um, I feel that my job on this, among, I work at a fairly large firm, it's Mark O'Connell, there are 60 of us, um, uh, and we financed a lot of the, the trip to Minnesota, and, I th and we're, we're, we're in. We think this is really, really important. But one of the things that, uh, that I think my job is as part of what, we'll, what we've, we've dubbed the supergroup, right, um, is to keep looking ahead at where we need to be going, right? It's kind of like start with the end in mind. And one of the issues that what you're all saying to yourselves as you're hearing this is like, oh, this is a really interesting idea about putting this plan together about what we're going to do to deal with the community-wide initiatives. But who's going to pay for this exactly, right? You know, it's always in the back of your mind, like, are we just doing a plan here? Um, or is this actually going to work? But I think what is interesting about this, and I think one of the things that I always, one of my mantras in life is money follows good ideas. This is a really, really good idea, right? and money will follow this, and we found in Minnesota that money has followed it, but one of the things that you can really do to kind of help that happen is to be thinking ahead. So, so and one other thing, um, and I'm sorry if I'm drifting a little bit, but one, one other thing. Um, 
we decided to do this session, and Christine, we had talked about doing this session, even though we weren't sure that it was the right time to do this session, because we haven't gone through the year yet. So we were saying to ourselves, well, maybe we want to do this next year, right? But then we said to ourselves, no, it makes sense for us to be telling you what we're trying to do here in these three communities. And if you want to keep in touch with us, not with us, with Christine, right? if you want to keep in touch with us while we're doing this so that you get a sense of whether this is working, then you should do that so that you can think about whether you want to try this. Because you know, we may be able to tell you a lot by the end of this year. You may know a lot about whether you want to try it in your community. and Because I, I think Christine's real, really, real goal is if this works in these three communities, we're going to try to roll it out. She has 14 communities in her ASAP. Um, to another set of communities, try to get every community done within the next couple of years so that you actually have a set of interrelated communities who have all developing their own plan, you know, because God forbid that Marlboro's plan should be the same as North Rose's plan, you know, it's like a whole, it's like, you know, Brookfield and Sturbridge, forget it, you know, Sturbridge and, and what's the name, the, the little place where they have the fairs, the, no, no, the one west, Brimfield. God knows, Springfield and Spurridge, no, no connection there at all, right? So everybody's got to have their own plan, but we want to have these communities constantly talking to each other about the plan. So things that you may want to be thinking about looking ahead, because you, if, if, if this works, we want to keep in mind where is the money going to come from to be dealing with this, right? Is the people you want to be involving probably early on, I think we're going to be talking some more about what the action teams are going to look like. The police and fire departments. The police and fire departments. Everybody's got a story of a first responder who has dealt with somebody with Alzheimer's and it wasn't good. It wasn't good, whether it was the police department or the, or the uh, fire department. I was just talking to some folks this morning at breakfast and one of the women there said, oh yeah, my husband's a, uh, you know, a fireman. They always talk about the, the frequent flyers. They're always referred to as the frequent flyers, you know. So, but now a piece of that may very well be that folks need to be understanding better how to speak Alzheimer's. But the training of that, of those folks, right, it probably is going to cost some money, right? That's probably going to need to come from town meeting. That's not going to fall from the sky, right? So you want these folks involved so that if, if you, the Council on Aging, is then making a run at town meeting, this is an ideal place for the Council on Aging to be in front of town meeting saying, don't we need some money so that our first responders can take care of you, Mr. Citizen, when you have a little, are having a little trouble with your memory? You know? So, police and fire, parks and rec. One of the communities that we, that, were, that we heard about in Minnesota was a community where parks and rec really got engaged in thinking about how to design their playground spaces, right? Or their park spaces so that they can be more dementia friendly, so that people will be less likely to get lost more likely to use them because parks are an ideal place for folks who have, who have got dementia. Once again, the fact that you can't remember real well and aren't real sure what tomorrow is going to bring doesn't mean you don't know what a good day is and what a beautiful day is, right? And one of the goals of the exercise so often is to get out of the house. You know, you know, all the, you know folks who somebody's got dementia and they're just staying in the house all the time, you know, because they're kind of afraid to go out. Where do they go? that doesn't cost money, well, there's a place, the parks, right? So, you know, parks and recs. The cable companies really early on, I mean, we've been talking about this a little bit in the supergroup. So how, if we're doing any public presentations during this first year, do we make sure that the cable companies are actively involved? Not in just the basic of going to the presentations, you know, or going to the public meetings, but doing some stories. Uh, for many of us, our cable companies are, are re located right at the schools, right? Right at the high school, or they're often connected with the school. This is a really interesting project. Alzheimer's stories are very personal stories, right? To get a, a high school kid who is really interested in this, who wants to do a story about this, who may even have a relative, someone that, you know, th they, would, they wouldn't be embarrassed about having a story about them. To have that coming into your local cable station while you're doing this project is really going to help you later on. Um, the boards of health, you'd never think of getting the boards of health typically involved in this, but what we're really talking about is a public health initiative. We're talking about looking at the folks with Alzheimer's spread across the community from the perspective of public health. How do we, how do we create the institutional framework 
that can help folks who have this disease deal with it by making everybody kind of part of the caregiving, right? So, so the Board of Health, these folks may be very, very interested in this as a, as a project. Education, this is a personal one of mine that I'm very interested in. It seems, anybody here from an assisted living facility? Oh good, so I can say this. It, it seems, <laughs> it is, it, I am, one of the concerns that I have and that I've expressed with these folks, right, is, um, you know, my day job, I'm in the private sector, right? And I'm watching everybody kind of moving all the time around the private sector. This is a very attractive marketing tool, right? Dementia-friendly community is a very attractive marketing tool. If you're an assisted living facility, um, and, you want, and often you're talking to people about your facility because you're saying that your folks are very well trained in, in dealing with dementia issues um, and that you can provide training to, to families in dementia, in dementia issues, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, if you were to Google dementia-friendly Massachusetts, doesn't that sound like kind of a public initiative, dementia-friendly Massachusetts? If you Google dementia-friendly Massachusetts and click you go to an assisted living site. There's a senior, senior, what is it called? Senior living residences, SL, SLR, right? They've already figured it out. They've, they've pulled this term into their marketing, right? So you've got all these, pe and, and a lot of people are, are selling. You know, the Alzheimer's Association is selling this, right? There are, there are the, uh, we were just talking to some folks who are opening up an assisted living in, in uh, Ashland. Oh, they've all been trained, or they're getting training by something called, oh, I don't know what it's called. But when you get the training, you get to call yourself a dementia community practice, uh, something, a certified dementia practitioner. What does that mean? It means that you spent some money and bought a certificate from a company in New Jersey, right? Now, that, that certificate came after some, some training, right? And maybe it's terrific, but I have no idea if it's terrific. I have no idea which ones of these programs are really training people. So a piece of what we need to be figuring out, all of us, perhaps your Board of Health does, right, is who are we saying it has, has gotten training which is really valuable in terms of really helping people with dementia. So when you're thinking ahead about how you want to be dealing with this stuff, you want to be thinking about this issue, right? Because you want to be kind of trying to preempt the private sector players who are really going to be trying to take this over, right? To preempt this issue, okay? Um, and the Councils on Aging, I think this just seems to me to be a perfect initiative for the Council on Aging, right? They're dealing, every one of their, every one of my clients, their biggest worry is this, is, is Alzheimer's, right? The Council on Aging, they, 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 their big concern is this. So the notion of the Council on Aging really using this as a driver for their policy in the future, right, could be a very exciting thing. Next slide. A um, couple of other things in terms of looking for those resources down the road. Uh, one is going to be the state. So it, when you're, if we're, as we're doing these meetings and we're thinking about them at the local level, one of the things that we've really talked about is making sure that the state senator and the state rep are knowledgeable about this, right? Um, in, in particular, as, as it happens in this, particular, um, in this particular ASAP, the center of this ASAP is, is, the, is the district of the Senate Ways and Means Chairman, Chairwoman, right? We think she may be very interested in this issue. This is a very, very important issue. So as you're thinking about where you might be going, you want to be kind of having those folks involved. Folks from the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, um, they want to be involved. We were just talking to the, 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 the new Secretary of Elder Affairs, who, as it happens, lives in Westboro, lives in one of the towns right next to where we are who was really interested in all of this, right? And we live next to Shrewsbury, which is the, where the lieutenant governor lives. We want to be connecting to the people kind of where they are in terms of perhaps it is at that level that we, they want to be figuring out whether there is some kind of um, home care worker certification program so that if you are providing home care through an agency or individually, perhaps if you're contracting through the frail elder waiver or if you're contracting in general, Maybe there needs to be some demonstration that if you're dealing with a folks person with Alzheimer's, that you've got the training, right? Um, 
what are the standards? And that was what I was kind of alluding to earlier. What are the standards for that kind of training? Um, and perhaps what is the state funding for that kind of training? Because if this works in enough communities, right, then this issue of providing the funding for training could be really interested. One of the, interesting. One of the things we've been talking about internally um, is that a lot of our models for this, and really kind of some of the model for Minnesota came from the United Kingdom, where they're, where they're kind, of, kind of ahead of a lot of this stuff, on a lot of this stuff. But it appears that much of that training, I'll we'll take that in just a second, it appears that much of that training um, is coming out of the community colleges and the universities. That there is there are that there are dementia there is certificates in dementia studies coming out of the schools. Maybe that's a direction where we want to kind of be looking. At the federal level, I'll just mention a couple. How many here have heard of Jimmo versus Sebelius? Anybody? No. Ah, there's one, right? So until Jimmo versus Sebelius, a case that happened in Vermont, it was a federal case and got settled about two years ago. Um, if you ask somebody it, it, who was in a, in, a, in a hospital or in a skilled nursing facility, when do your benefits end? The answer was when you stop getting better. Because the premise was if you were getting better, well then Medicare was gonna keep paying for it. But after that it stopped. Well this case changed that because they challenged the, the, the Medicare law and, 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 and finally CMS, the, the, the entity that controls Medicare, conceded on this and said no, the measure of whether you need Medicare is whether you need skilled services. Even if those skilled services are only required to keep you the way you are or to keep you from getting worse. Now think about that in the context of what we're trying to accomplish here, right? Where one of the skilled services provided by Medicare is occupational therapy. Isn't this kind of case management for a person who is at home and training and supervision for the people who are providing day-to-day -day services to a person with Alzheimer's, isn't that occupational therapy to treat a disease? And, and therefore, shouldn't that be covered? Shouldn't that be covered? Now, at this point, you're gonna have trouble convincing CMS that it should be covered, right? The decision of whether that works is gonna become a political decision, right? But this kind of program from the grassroots could cause that kind of major change, I really believe. Next slide. Um, finally, you want to be thinking ahead toward where the champions are who are going to be paying for this in the longer run. Having, having said that you want to be kind of careful about the providers who are, who are selling things in these areas, some of the obviously, obvious ones are the assisted living. If you have an assisted living in your community, an assisted living uh, um, uh, community that is really engaged in the community could be an ideal place for a lot of this work to happen and could be the place from which you may be able to find funding in the future. Home care agencies that are in your area, the hospital that is in your area, and finally um, a lot of the funding that um, Christine was able to get in order to start this project has come from the insurers, right, or from the foundations that are funded by the insurers or foundations that are funded by the hospitals. One of the folks that I think we've really talked, we've talked a little about and that we're very interested in is Blue Cross. Blue Cross, which has a gajillion dollars, right, uh, actually in kind of reserves and has done a lot of kind of very, and is very interested in this. All the insurers are really interested in how you figure out these kinds of global community-wide solutions that are ultimately going to decrease the number of people who are going into the hospital, right? So, as you, as you hear about the evolution of these programs locally, you, know, you want to keep in the back of your mind to the extent that you can and you have some of these players in your community, getting these players involved so that they'll be knowing what you're doing and be wanting to participate in the next level. Thank you. Um, as far as insurance companies, with the funding piece of this, my initial my initial grant request to, was to the Metro West Health Foundation for this program. Uh, the cap on the grant, they set at $20,000, which we know is, is just absolutely nothing when you're trying to put this together. What is attractive to the foundation is that this is um, a multi-community project. They want to see you forming partnerships on the local level, and uh, that's very, very attractive. I just submitted a grant request to Tufts. I was invited to submit to Tufts. 
under, uh, I think it's the President's uh, Leadership Award because the President's Leadership uh, Grant has to do with efforts on a uh, multi-community level, on a grassroots level. So th this program is attractive to insurers if you're coming in at more than just one community, and I, I would urge everybody to at least have another community in with you so you can bounce things off each other. But as far as the health foundations, they're looking, Tufts is age-friendly, age-friendly communities, that's their focus now. I say dementia-friendly is a subset of age-friendly. You have to be dementia-friendly in order to do age-friendly. So we have submitted to them. I submitted to Fallon. This, I was not asked to uh, submit a full request to them. So their sh shift is a little bit different. But again, I, I do believe that this is very, very attractive to people, especially at the grassroots level. All I'm paying for is a coordinator. That's just what I'm paying for. Yes. Um, so we've really driven home the fact that it's it's community engagement and it's a grassroots level. So it's really the people in your community that will be driving whatever project that that action team in the community is going to um, choose and, and roll forward in that community. So um, Janice and, and Hudson, Trish and Marlboro and, and myself in Northboro, we really know our communities. We know who's out there, who is maybe dealing with Alzheimer's and, and we'll, we'll talk about about the action team, but it's important to think about having somebody who is um, on that journey and having dementia or Alzheimer's to be on that action team. They're caregivers. Um, getting people to buy in. I, I, I go back to a quote that Arthur used often when we were in Minnesota. It's the right thing to do for your community. And, and really, that's what it is. And I think that resonates with people in your community, is that this is, this is the right thing to do. The statistics are there. We're going to be dealing with a lot of people that have this disease and, and other dementias, and that we need to do something to make our community respond to that. Um, what's in it for me? Uh, this was one of our first questions when we got out to Minnesota to the trainers. What, you know, what kind of things do people bring to the table? Were they looking for, what's it going to do for my business? Um, and so they really drove home to us that um, you encourage people to leave their professional hat at the door um, and really sit down at the table as a community member um, and doing that right thing, getting this, um, this dementia-friendly community something that's uh, second nature in your town. So we move on to who is on the ac action team. Um, we're all going to be rolling out our action teams in the, in the three towns. We're going to try to stay on the same timeline so that we can um, go forward through this process at the same time. But I think we're going to have very different action teams just because our communities are very different and we're going to have very um, different projects that that action team is going to come um, and, and come to the table and say this is what we want to work on. Um, so. It, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to not only think of, you know, you think of the fire chief, the police chief, the board of health agent, but think about in your dealings with um, those departments. Is there an EMT that, you know, just seems to have an interest? Um, you know, he or she might have somebody in their family that's dealing with that. Um, so really try to pick a diverse group of people and somebody from every sector. So we talked about um, you know, local government, so, and, and the library was brought up. Maybe one of the librarians um, could be sitting at that table. Um, somebody from a, a nursing home or an assisted living in town. Uh, businesses, we talked, we have somebody right now at our senior center, um, her bank really encourages community involvement, so she comes and helps out with our um, little restaurant that we have at the senior center. But she's dealing with people that are not able to balance their checkbook and may have some of the early signs. And so somebody like that would be very interested, I think, to come and sit at the table. It's just important to find people from every sector um, so that this will work, so that it's, it's something that people recognize if they're living and working in the community, this is something we're working on as a, as a group. Uh, <laughs> it, it really varies. 
And I know one of the struggles that we talked about when we were, you know, each of us were trying to come up with our own group um, is you're going to set up a, you know, these are typically busy people that you're going to have sitting at the table. Uh, n Tuesday at 4 o'clock is not going to work for everybody. So I would say to make that, that group a little bit bigger when you do your original um, list of people, knowing that not everybody is going to be able to come to the table. The other thing that's important is you're going to have that action team that's going to have meetings. But we're going to talk a little bit ab about that data and the analysis and all that. Those are people that you can get involved as taking the surveys and going around and doing that kind of thing in the community. So they don't need to be necessarily the people that come to the table, but they're involved in the project. Um, we talked a little bit about um, with Baypath, for instance. Um, maybe Christine could find some funds within Baypath that could provide some respite so that the caregivers could come to um, the meetings because, you know, as we know, the caregivers, it's hard to get away. It's hard to make that commitment to something, but is there something we can do to make that happen? Um, what next? Um, the, the, this is what I'm talking about, the surveys. So, um, as Christine mentioned, the surveys um, are very um, much tailored to a sector. And if you have a volunteer that maybe goes out and delivers those surveys to um, the different places in the community, but then goes back and does one-on-one -on -one or face-to-face -face interviews and goes over the survey, that's really collecting the data of what does your community have right now, what is the community doing well, what does the community need to work on. Um, and the survey results will give you data, and, and this is where my head started to swim a little bit when we were in the training, because there's a matrix that actually um, tabulates and tallies all of the, um, you can go to the next slide so we can see some, um, tabulates all of this. So this is an example of a part of the survey, the level of current um, activity and in, in, the, in the community. So these are, that's just a sample, but as you go through and then put all of that data into the matrix, it's really going to bring home what your community is doing well and what, those, what are the things you want to work on. And then all of that analysis is done by that action team. So they look at all that data. It, you know, it's scientific at this point. It's not just um, you know, a kind of a fluff survey. So what, what do we, and that's going to drive the project because each action team in, in any community, and we saw so many of them in Minnesota, it might be creating literature. Um, in one community, they created literature that had a woman's picture um, on the front cover. It was great because she was really the champion for that community. Her husband was a very well-known uh, high school teacher. And so everybody recognized her picture. She was holding a framed picture of her late husband. Um, he was well-liked, well-respected, and he had gone through the journey. And she brought out in that article the rough times that she had, where she was trying, she recognized what he was going through. His colleagues and his friends didn't. Th thought that, you know, she didn't know what she was talking about. Bill's fine. Um, so it really, it, 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 in that way, it was an easy brochure for people to pick up and kind of understand a little bit more about um, the caregiver and, and kind of what the, the journey of Alzheimer's and dementia looks like. Um, so, so basically, the, that action plan, after the surveys are done, um, collected, analyzed, the data is there, then the action team gets together and says, okay, now we know exactly where we're going to go. These are the needs that we have in the community. Um, we, like I said before, we saw so many examples of action teams and what they came up with and everybody was different. Um, that, that brochure I talked about was one community. Um, so some of the communities really said we're going to focus on the police department, we're going to do training so that there won't be that um, awful experience for both parties when, um, when they're dealing with somebody with dementia that they have no idea how to handle. Um, initiating a memory cafe. You know, we see memory cafes that are set up within, um, you know, a daycare model, for instance, or within a senior center, but wouldn't it be great to have that memory cafe, you know, at Panera's in your community so that people are comfortable, they know, the wait staff know, um, you know, what the needs are of that particular population, and um, they're, they're in their community and active and, um, and making friends. 
Uh, dementia friends, again, is something that was um, my Arthur had alluded to in the UK. Um, it's really a training, like an hour-long training, where people can um, be certified as a dementia friend. And really, it's accepting um, and, and promising that when you come across somebody in your community with dementia or Alzheimer's, that um, you know how to treat them with respect and, and what's going on with them. And, um, and it's really an awareness of, of people with dementia. Um, the screening events we talked about as well, and the education. We, we talked a little bit about um, even going into the schools and having education in, in the schools because then the kids are going to grow up with that and there won't be a need to do the um, adult education because it'll be something that they've already um, witnessed and they've already learned about on in a school age level. Okay, now I'm going to talk more about the dry stuff from the national level. What I will tell you is that Bay Path has made a commitment to this project. I feel very, very strongly about it. I feel it is in our strategic plan. It is certainly, as an area agency on aging, we look at the needs of all individuals in the community. And I have known many of our home care clients who have had dementia and their caregivers. So I've, co I've committed my, my agency resources in kind to do this. My board is fully behind this. When I first presented it to the board, I had one board member, not from these three communities, who came up and said, I want this in my community. And he's, he just sent me an email saying, when are you coming? <laughs> when are you coming? I want this in my community. Selectmen are on board, police chiefs on board. We want this in our community. So the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, or N4A, is really promoting age-friendly communities. So this is the look of what's going on on the national level that will support all the efforts on the grassroots level. And the good news is there is support on the national level. And for a again, age-friendly communities, very important that folks have the ability to stay in the community of their choice and be able to live independently with dignity. The White House Conference on Aging, which just concluded a few months ago, one of the front-running items on that was age, uh, Dementia-Friendly America. That's their new initiative, Dementia-Friendly America. And there's a, a website for Dementia-Friendly America. If you go to that website and it's included in the resources, you will find one page that gives you a little information and says this is really a work in progress. So they are just beginning on that. But they are looking at large urban areas, cities, to roll this out in. And that's very possible, but again, looking at your action team and how are you going to roll out being age-friendly? How are you going to roll out being dementia-friendly? Boston is actually working on an, an age-friendly initiative as we speak. Uh, okay, age-friendly communities and the grants process, I already talked about a little bit. Okay, next slide. Okay, so when we look at a dementia-friendly community, and this goes back to this, this slide, what does a dementia-friendly community look like to you? Well, to me, it looks like people who are understanding. Um, I, I think my goal out of this is there's a, a restaurant I favor in downtown Marlboro. I, wa I want them to have a memory cafe once a month. One of my staff wants it to be at Starbucks, but I think the restaurant is better. Janice will go to the rail trail in Hudson and have it there. So... And you know what the resources are in the community. Where are you going for down? Where are you going for downtown? But community-based supports just means that that there's p places for people to go to in the community that are accepting, whether it be a, whether it be faith-based, whether it be a restaurant, whether it be a store to go shopping in. They're all people are trained. People know this early warning signs of dementia. You want to promote people having an independence and quality of life. That's all any of us want, that independence and quality of life. My mother, who turned 83 um, yesterday, as a matter of fact. I didn't call my mother. Oh. <laughs> I'm a bad daughter. Uh, my mother is 83. Uh, she lives by herself. My brother lives a half hour away. She lives in New Jersey. She is petrified of lo losing her independence. Uh, she, <laughs> unknown to us, she was driving with very bad cataracts. <laughs> a couple of years ago, she had a very bad fall, and she was actually terror-stricken 
thinking that she would not be able to drive anymore and lose her independence. It, it terrified her. The transportation system where she lives is not that great, but she was absolutely panic-stricken of losing her independence. And we all know that happens to older adults. I worry about as, as well. We all do, losing my independence. So the meaningful engagement activities, may have you, uh, there's another initiative going on in Massachusetts, uh, Art for Owls. Art for Alzheimer's, that promotes these type of in, enriching, engaging activities for people going to a museum, a museum afternoon for, only for people with dementia, or having that memory cafe. Next, please. All right, I put this up here because it's critically important to know about dementia uh, planning for emergency responders. And I personally am, am very, very worried in my communities that if an emergency happens, and we all know that it does happen, and older adults have to evacuate to a shelter, what's going to happen to the people with dementia? Now they're in an unfamiliar environment. Everybody's very anxious anyway because it's an emergency. And what's going to happen to these folks? So it's really critically important. I feel, and I think the team feels the same way, that we train those emergency responders, law enforcement officials, to really be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's, and then how to work with those people, how to approach them, how to engage them, so that there's not a catastrophic outcome. So next, please. This is the place for questions. Now, the other thing I wanted to tell you, um, when we went to Minnesota, and they were such gracious folks, absolutely wonderful folks. Oh, by the way, we're across the street from the Mall of America. So if you want to know about Mall of America, ask Janice or Kelly. They went over. <laughs> um, I have a number of materials from there, brochures and other items that they developed. And there's a one, one very large pamphlet on each of the 36 communities that developed the Act, Act on Alzheimer's initiative and what they had as their action plans and where they are in the process. When I went to Minnesota, I was totally over, very frankly, I was very overwhelmed and concerned of how, was, how were we going to pull this off in each community. What I learned was there are going to be folks who don't want to engage in this, and that's fine. So you're not necessarily going to get everybody. You're going to bite off the elephant one piece at a time. I know in one of the Alzheimer's communities, they could not, for the life of them, engage the Hispanic community. They tried, they tried, they could not engage them. They'll continue to try, but you have to then move on and say, okay, what else? Also, a community does not need to be a whole town. It can be a faith-based community. What are you defining as community? Uh, there is a, um, from one or two of the synagogues uh, in Minnesota, uh, work together to develop Act on Alzheimer's for their Jewish community. So it doesn't have to be a whole town, a whole city. City of St. Paul, how they identified their community was by zip code. They had three or four zip codes, contiguous zip codes, and they rolled it out in that community. So it's all how you define community, not necessarily the entirety of the city of Worcester. Uh, okay, so just very briefly, because we're just about out of time, your resources, Act on Alzheimer's Minnesota, go to it, you'll be uh, blown away, frankly, because I was at the breadth of information there. Senior Living Residences, uh, residences DementiaFriendlyMass.org. They have started out in Westfield, and they are, are, again, trying to branch out, of course, the Alzheimer's Association. And then Sterling University in Scotland, Arthur mentioned they're doing a tremendous amount of work with dementia, and there are a lot of other resources on their website as well. Final slide. <coughs> Feel free to contact us. And I say that with, with truly from my heart. I am more than willing and happy, and I'm, any of us are willing and happy to give you assistance, kind of give you, keep you in updates, uh, help you out with this, answer questions. Whatever you have, please contact us. Ah, yes. Yeah. So the reason why you, the camera is there, um, I have, whenever I do presentations, I always use this make-believe couple, Frank and Mary. That I always tell them that, you know, that, and their goal in life, and they live in this little house with their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. 
And I always tell people, if you get that joke, that means you're old enough to be my client. Uh, it, and, and, but, but they have their own YouTube channel, so it's Elder, Elder Law Frank and Mary, right? Elder Law Frank and Mary. So if you want to see this show again, or if you know anybody that you think wants, should see this, we'll be uploading this to, a, to the YouTube channel within the next, in, in, in a while. But but this but we're not but we're, we're not typically when we do a presentation it also goes up in the local town cable we're not we're not doing this in Sturbridge town cable that's why I'm, no, I'm just no, saying. I'm saying Northboro and oh, and so in Northboro and Marlboro and Hudson, this will be on their cable station too. So th thank you. And the last thing is, feel free to come up and look at the um, the toolkit, and I will put out some other resources and materials that we have from Minnesota. So thank you very much for attending. Please complete the evaluation form and give it to that wonderful lady in the pink vest in the back. Thank you for your help, and good luck. Good luck, and thank you for coming. <laughs>